On April the 15th, 1912, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a British liner, the RMS Titanic, was sinking. In the early hours of the previous night, she had struck an iceberg. She was running out of time and on the deck, half of over 2,000 passengers and crew were fighting for their lives. In the scramble for survival, eight men played on while the ship was descending down the water. These men were the musicians who were going down to their deaths. They didn't attempt to save themselves, and instead they played on until the end. These are the stories of the musicians of the Titanic. On the 20th of April 1912, a cable ship called the Mackie Bennett anchored close to the position where the RMS Titanic had sunk. Aboard, the ship carried out 100 coffins and 100 tons of ice for recovered bodies. Contracted by the commercial cable company and White Star Line to carry out the task, the crew of the Mackay Bennett took up the ship's lifeboats and rowed into the area where they would have seen a site full of wreckage. For days, bodies were recovered, and some were so decomposed which it made it hard to identify individuals. When the bodies were recovered, a system had been followed because the ship hadn't had enough room to include over 200 bodies. Because of this, it had been decided that only first and second class passengers could be on board. Third class and decomposed bodies were buried at sea. While the crew were sailing into the area, they recovered three three bodies between the 23rd and the 25th of April. They were numbered 193, 207 and 224, but because of the conditions and the items they carried, they were easily identified. Upon their boarding, it was discovered that body 193 was Jock Hume, 202 John Clark and 224 Wallace Hartley. Hartley's body was likely placed inside a coffin for, by the time of his death, he had become a national hero. Hume and Clark's bodies didn't have coffins. As second-class passengers, their bodies were embalmed, wrapped in canvas and stored in the forward cable locker. The bodies of the remaining musicians were never found. Following their return to Halifax, Nova Scotia, the crew of the Mackay Bennett returned with 190 bodies. When the three bodies had arrived, their families were informed by White Star. The company also gave the families a choice with the second option of returning the bodies to England with a fee of £20, which would have been over £1 million today. Sadly, this was the offer the families of Hume and Clark couldn't afford. As a result, both men were buried in Halifax with no family members and friends in attendance of their funerals. However, because of his fame following the disaster, White Star paid for Wallace Hartley's body while his father paid for his coffin. Hartley's body and coffin travelled back to Liverpool on the Arabic after travelling by train to Boston. It arrived on the 17th of May and on the 18th a funeral service was held at the Bethel Chapel in Colm. He was buried in the family vault at the cemetery.
However, the families weren't left alone to grieve in peace. Two weeks after the disaster, Jock Hume's father, Andrew Hume, received a letter from the Black Brothers. In the letter to him, they asked Hume if he could send a sum of nine shillings and threepence for Jock's uniform he wore on the Titanic's voyage. When Jock went to J.J. Rayner's shop in Liverpool, he had signed a receipt permitting the Black Brothers to deduct the sum from his wage account. In other words, Jock had to pay for his rented uniform through the wages he would have received from his time on the Titanic. But because of the ship's sinking, the brothers thought that his full payment wasn't eligible. So they turned to Jock's family to pay for the uniform instead. Outraged, Andrew Hume took his case to the Algamated Musicians Union, as did Clara Taylor, the wife of Percy Taylor, Ronald Braley, the father of Theo Braley, and Martha Woodwold, the mother of Wes Woodwold. The families of the musicians explained to the union that the brothers didn't receive a fund for the deaths of their sons and husbands. The brothers denied them any funding as they claimed that the issue of compensation wasn't a legal claim. Liam Brico, Ronald Braley and Andrew Hume filed a lawsuit against the brothers and the cases were taken to the Liverpool County Court in November. 1912. The families pleaded their cases to explain the mistreatment of their sons with the agency and how they were treated after the disaster. But because the musicians weren't legally crew members of the White Star Line, they were employed by the Black Brothers and there wasn't enough evidence to prove negligence on their part. Sadly, the court was in favour of the Black Brothers and the families never received any form of compensation. The family of Georges Crins filed a $25,000 claim against the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, owner of the White Star Line, for not paying them compensation for Georges' death. The case was taken to court in 1914, but the ruling was in favour of the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company. The families have been failed by the Black Brothers, the White Star Line and Bruce Ismay because as chairman, these matters were his responsibility. Historians have debated whether the White Star Line should have been fined for their treatment towards the musicians. However, as this was no evidence, the charges of the White Star, just as much as the other companies being found guilty, were very slim. In the end, there was no justice for them. However, seven out of the eight families of the musicians received money from the Titanic Relief fund. However, Andrew Hume had to deal with another court case involving the fund and involving Jacques' fiance Mary Coston. Mary, who was pregnant at the time, claimed that she was entitled to some money from the fund because of her and Jock's unborn child. Andrew didn't think she was. In the end, Mary won her case and as a result, Andrew had to pay expenses to her. The results of the Titanic disaster left broken hearts for their loved ones, but the musicians' families and fiancés carried on with their lives. After the disaster, some of the families kept in touch with each other. At one point, the fathers of Roger Brico and Georges Kins met up with one survivor in Paris so they could get some closure to what happened to their sons. Theo's parents moved from London to Sussex, but their house was burnt down and they lost everything they owned. With no insurance, they moved back to London to live with Theo's sisters. Ronald died in 1931 and Amy in 1942. Theo's fiancée, Theresa Steelhaber, never recovered from Theo's loss on the Titanic. She died in Scotland in 1985. Fred Clark's mother, Ellen, died in 1935 nearly penniless. Wallace Hartley's fiancée, Maria Robinson, never married and died in 1939. Wallace's parents, Alban and Elizabeth, 
passed away in 1927 and 1934 respectively. Clara Taylor remarried in 1918 to singer Albert Pierce and during their marriage the couple performed in music halls together under the name Talbot and Pierce. They alongside their siblings bought and opened a restaurant in Somerset called Margaret's Grill. Clara died in 1956. Sadly, there are no full records of what happened to the Woodwold family following Wes's passing. The Jouskin siblings went on to get married and have children. One had a son who was named after his uncle. In the 1970s, Zhuzh's sister, Madeline, was struggling financially and in a letter she wrote to the Charity Commission asking about what happened to the money from the relief fund. In the Brucox family, Leon maintained an active interest in the inquiry and continued battling for compensation. Although Roger Brico's body was never found, he was due to join the French military service in late 1912. However, the French army weren't informed of his death and believing he was a deserter, Brico was reported missing in 1913. Brico wasn't registered as deceased until 87 years later, when the French Titanic Association mentioned Brico's loss in the Titanic disaster. In late 2000, the association unveiled a memorial plaque in his hometown. Following the court case involving himself and his son's former fiancé, Andrew Hume was in financial debt and was made homeless. In 1914, one of Jock's sisters was murdered by German soldiers inside a military hospital in Brussels. Except this never happened. This was made up by his older sister, Kate, who had a mental breakdown following her brother's death and which she never recovered. She was imprisoned for three months and then released on probation. Andrew moved to Peterborough and London in the 20s and in 1934 he died of a brain hemorrhage. Mary, Jock's fiance, died of tuberculosis in 1922. Jock and Mary's daughter, Jackie Law Hume Costin, was orphaned at 10 years old. When she moved to London, Jackie found work as a sales girl and later she worked for the Daily Mirror and in the British film industry. She married John Ward, a crime reporter, and they had two children together. One child, Christopher, would go on to become a journalist for a British newspaper, The Mail. Jackie died in 1996. Today, the legacies of Titanic's musicians continue in their hometowns and many cities around the world. The cities include Southampton, where there is a musician's memorial to them, a brass tablet at the Philharmonic Hall, and a memorial in the city of Broken Hill in Australia. In Cone, the Bethel Chapel has a memorial garden which commemorates Wallace Hartley. There is even a violin statue centred in the middle of the gardens. Considered heroes of the disaster, the musicians and their stories have been the subject of bravery and fascination. However, they are often faded into the background in favour of other passengers and crew members. They may not be as grand as JJ Astor or Captain Edward Smith, but they all have a special part in Titanic's history. It is hoped that with this documentary, their story will live on and be retold for generations to come.